Good afternoon. I'm John Adams, also a class of 73. And uh, my name came up this morning. And, uh, and I'd like to say only that I have the greatest respect and admiration for the many talents and accomplishments of my former Foreign Service ca classmate. <laughs> but this afternoon's discussion is about um, um, identity politics and the uh, inclusion and exclusion aspects of our political situation. And it's, our discussion will be moderated by, Sugat, by Sonu Jan, who is a senior communications officer at the World Bank in Washington, where she leads the advocacy and communications um, on pollution and natural resource economics. We're particularly lucky to have her today and particularly grateful that she could be here because uh, the spring meetings of the World Bank and IMF are taking place today. And so she's, she's missing that activity in Washington. And prior to working at the World Bank, she was a senior editor at the Indian Express, a national newspaper, and wrote extensively on development and social issues in India. She has won a number of awards for journalism, including the Chameli Devi Award, for the best woman journalist of, in India. And she's been a Reuters Fellow at Oxford and a student here at the Kennedy School where she earned an MPA. And after that, she went to the World Bank. So please welcome uh, Sonu Jain. To our Thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be back. It's been 10 years, so glad to be back in Cambridge. Um, so we, I think we have an exciting one and a half hours with this uh, very distinguished uh, panel that I will introduce in a minute. But before I do that, I just want to, um, you know, to again think about the topic that we have on hand, and it's um, identity politics, inclusion, exclusion. Um, I think all of us here are familiar with the Black Lives Movement, the uh, Me Too movement, the Yellow Vest movement in France, the uh, LBGTQ movement. These are all manifestations of identity politics. And in some sense, I think identity politics is part of democracy. It's part of any healthy democracy. Uh, but the question is that can it be divisive or disruptive, or can it be constructive and you know strengthen democracy? So this is what we'll try and deliberate in the next one and a half hours. Uh, so coming back to South Asia, and you see around me are a lot of experts who've looked at this issue, uh, you know, very very in a very detailed manner, and. Uh, in South Asia, these, the, this inclusive, uh, whether you know, identity politics is good or bad, there, there are both examples. In India, we've had Dalit reservation you know, for years now, and I think some might disagree whether it's, it's had benefits or not, but generally speaking, it's seen as a success. And Dalits were the, you know, for those of you who are not familiar, were the lowest in the, in the, in the caste system. And, and because of reservations, you know, there's a huge improvement in where they are and their representation in politics. Uh, in the US, there's been civil rights movement. So basically, identity politics is when certain groups, uh, whether based on gender, whether based on religious affiliations or caste or, uh, you, know, you know, they get together and they try and find a voice. So let's turn to our panelists and, and see where we are with this question in South Asia. So um, to my right is Iram, who's, uh, who, uh, who has received her doctorate from Harvard Law School. Her research focuses on issues of water federalism and transboundary water sharing in the Indus River Basin. She is also a barrister at law from the Honorable Society of Lincoln's Inn. Uh, she's co-founded the Water Law Study Group at Harvard Law School, and she teaches water law and policy in, um, in, in, at the Pace University School of Law, Northeastern University School of Law, and Tufts University. Uh, we have 
uh, Professor Myerson, Roger Myerson. Um, he's a Nobel laureate. Very rarely do we have Nobel, <laughs> Nobel laureates in our panel. So uh, we are happy to have you here, mm -hmm. Professor. So um, he is the distinguished uh, David Pearson uh, Professor of Global Conflict Studies at the University of Chicago. He's also taught at the Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University. Um, he uh, has written extensively on game theory, information economics, and game theoretical analysis of political institutions. He was awarded the 2007 Nobel Memori Memorial Prize in Economic Services in recognition of his contributions to mechanism design theory. And, and we, again, very happy to have you here. Uh, there's Ruhi Abdullah, uh, who is a Mason Fellow right now uh, at the at HKS. She is uh, one of the first recipients of Benazir Bhutto Leadership Program Fellowship and the first cohort of Climate Leaders Program Fellow at Harvard University and Center of Public Leadership Program. She was uh, born in Karachi and has worked with the World Bank for the last 16 years in urban water and energy sectors. Uh, she ha has been trained as a planner from MIT and has been published extensively on the issue of water uh, service delivery. So Ali, sitting on my left, uh, has 25 years of uh, international work experience in public and private financial sector including the chairman, uh, including as chairman of Securities and Exchange Commission of Pakistan, the apex regulator for the country's corporate insurance and financial sector other than banking. He's also been on several boards and, uh, you know, companies in IT, digital media and food sectors and has served on the board of leading Pakistanis, uh, Pakistan corporations and stock exchange. Um, so with this distinguished panel, um, I think I'll start my first question with Ira. So let's, you know, let's look at what identity politics has done to development. You know, the implications of uh, what what identity poli politics has on development. So let's zoom into the Indus Valley. It's one of the largest rivers in the world, uh, 450,000 square miles uh, worth of basin. 70% of Pakistanis who depend on agriculture, depend on waters from the Indus. And Iram, you've spent years looking at this issue. So give us a sense of what's going on and what has that got to do with the way democratic institutions are structured in Pakistan? Thank you, Sona. That's such a rich, rich question. And um, so I'm going to try and dive right into some of these things that I really think about very deeply. And I, I hope that that, you know, it allows us to have a rich conversation. I love that we're here talking about a, a critical natural resource that I work on, which is water and water governance, which has transboundary implications, which in a federal system such as the US and in Pakistan has massive sort of governance at all levels that sort of, you know, interact with, with how, how this resource is managed. But I think what's interesting is, as somebody who's sort of a legal historian and people will appreciate, I really think it's important to have a very deep sense of history. And that very deep sense of history, in our case, in many ways, if you look at the Indus, you can go back to Mohenjo-daro and you can say, this is a Bronze Era civilization, fully developed, you know, with drainage and water control, massive irrigation control. Uh, 3,500 years ago, I mean, we have what is like, you know, the, the what is colloquially, even though we don't know that she was a dancer, like the dancing girl of the Indus, a beautiful sort of sculpture. All of you can probably Google this and find this. So a very highly developed uh, uh, sort of civilization that exists in the Indus River Basin, and it only comes from the control of water. In a hydrologically dry environment, there's no way for people to live uh, without controlling water year-round, because obviously you need to you know, live 12 years a month, and meanwhile the rains are only going to come maybe three months, right? So controlling water really is critical to what you do as, as, as an economy, as a people, and, and really as a civilization. So it really shapes. Now I'm going to jump several Several thousand years ahead from <laughs> Mohenjo-daro to what the British did in India. The British essentially made the Punjab, the largest province in now Pakistan, they basically made it the granary of British India. 
And that meant that there was a lot of colonial settlement, so that there was land division at a very small acreage level, subsistence level farming, 12 and a half acres, that was given essentially to sort of conquered soldiers. So in, in very broad sort of you know geopolitical terms, it's sort of what America didn't manage to do in Iraq. Like what, do you, what happens once you disband Saddam's army? Uh, once you disband it, maybe some of them become ISIS or not, or something really bad starts happening. But the British understood that once they dismantled Ranjit Singh's army, what they had to do is to give them some kind of livelihood and tie them to the empire. So that's what they did. So the whole ethos of land division, the control of what the army has, where, I mean, we've heard it several times in the morning, people have said, look, the army has to get out of the economy, it has to get out of the economy. It's the British who create these massive land grants to the army, which gives it the control that it needs to get sort of going and become as large as it is once you know, partition happens. So the, the then lastly, which is really important once you look at river systems, is that place really matters. It's like in all real estate. It's like location, location, location. So upstream, downstream really matters. All of the uh, uh, the glaciers that we're talking about for the Indus River system essentially originate in Tibet. So control of you know, who controls Tibet is massive. China is upstream of everybody um, on, you know, in this entire sort of, uh, you know, uh, on this entire plateau. And then India is upstream, and therefore its control of Kashmir really matters, right? Because that's where the glaciers come to Pakistan from. And a lot of the Kashmir story is this is, is a water story, I think, and I may be sort of very biased because I obsess about water, because I think control of Kashmir has a lot to do with who controls the headwaters of the Indus. And so that's why Pakistan is sort of security obsessed, and it really worries about what India is doing in Kashmir. Once coming down within Pakistan, Punjab is upstream of Sindh. So what the British, after they made the Punjab the granary of sort of British India, what that does is everybody becomes some sort of a small agricultural landholder. In many ways, this is like your ideal of this Jeffersonian democracy, right? This idea is that somehow like some kind of landholding is some kind of democratic base. But that means it starts off, I mean, we have like a serious economist here, so I'm going to try not show my ignorance, but it really creates a political economy, um, sort of a chain that is unstoppable in many ways. Like this is a train, it's on its tracks, and we have interest groups that really care about controlling that water. So Punjab, where so much of the agricultural system is based, really believes that it needs a certain kind of development. That certain kind of development really comes from, I mean, this is what you have presumably also worked at at the bank, which is large scale infrastructure. So dams become critical because all you have to do is keep building, 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 and you know, giving more water to this agricultural economy. So your interests are very much tied to, and the thing that I really hope that you take from this is your interests and how you perceive yourself, like this idea of identity. In Pakistan's case, at least, it is really tied to an agricultural, rural, land-holding idea of democracy that the British did try to institute in India. And therefore, that gives sort of, you know, a rise to its own rationale, which is big development of large infrastructure, controlling water. So it's very interest space. You have an identity as an agriculturalist, but it then gets tied into your ethnic provincial sort of, you know, but I'm suggesting that it has something to do with where you are locationally on a river system also. So all of this coheres in a very complex way to say big development and your identity as an agriculturalist means that large scale infrastructure needs to get made. Now if you're downstream in Sindh, especially people who are very marginalized and poor downstream who live in the delta, who feel the rising effects of climate change, increasing soil salinity, all kinds of sort of glacial melt and sort of, you know, um, alluvial floodplains that are not, as a result, sort of getting recharged by uh, sediment that's coming in from the Himalayas, essentially you're really marginalized, but you are then that excluded almost. And then it becomes even more complex, and then I'll stop here, is that who is a nationalist, who is a patriot, gets tied to how you see yourself. 
if you are someone who is opposing a big development agenda, you are really seen as a traitor, anti-development, and as if you're a real enemy of the state. So therefore, imagine that that excluded population that doesn't have the gains of everything that's happening, that excluded population now is almost this anti-state voice. And how do you then get into the rooms where the decisions are made? So it's, it's all complex. It's a lot of historical sort of, you know, commingling of influences that are happening. And I hope that we get to unpack some of this. But it is in the realm of natural resources, especially water governance that I look at very closely, it's intertwined in this really complex way. And maybe in the, in the possible future panel that we think of, uh, we'll have some ideas of, you know, where to go next, as Professor Bose uh, was telling us to do this morning. Thanks, Iram. Uh, that's, that's a great overview of, you know, how identities are formed in, in this large river basin area. And, and I'm sure we'll come back to this question and explore further. But before we do that, let me turn to uh, Roger, who's looked at, uh, you know, who's an expert on game theory. And interestingly, he's applied game theory to political institutions. And he's, we are lucky to, ha you know, to, to have him look at Pakistan's institutions. So what is your read on, on, uh, the, the, on the state of democracy and the way institutions are structured in Pakistan and some of what Iram said of the way identities are formed and, 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 uh, and the fact that you know, this, this state of democracy, whether it's healthy or not, we would love to hear from you. I think the, uh, the suggestion that, that, that there are problems and, and that, that, that Pakistan's democracy is still weak, but, but that it, there has been real progress, I think that's true and really is important. Um, I am a game theorist and, and, uh, and I stud from, it's from a very abstract perspective I tried to study democracy and the question of what's wrong with democracy is with our overall, so, so I've tried to understand when does democracy work and when, do, when, does, when does it seem unsatisfactory from fundamental viewpoint? And it's, it's thanks, to, it's Benazir Bhutto being her classmate that's gotten me uh, involved with Pakistan. I, I, if one, I want to give credit, I, being her, I think we exchanged seven words once in college, but, uh, but, but, but I have had the privilege of going to reunions with people who were really her friend, uh, really her friends, and, uh, and, 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 be, and through that became involved. Uh, and I reached out, uh, it's first um, um, uh, and, and it, was, it was from that that, 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 that my co-authors, uh, Adnan Khan, who is visiting Kennedy School this year, uh, also at London School of Economics, and, and Ali Chima in, uh, in, uh, in, in Lahore University of Management Science, and I started working together in response to the fact that I was thinking about Pakistan as, as a result of, of, of reunion events uh, in honoring her memory. Um, I wanted to hold her book here because, uh, uh, let me say, one of the main themes of her book was meant to be addressing the, 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 the un uh, misunderstandings about the relationship between Islam and democracy. And, and let me say as one who is not a Muslim, that, uh, I, but, but has read the history as carefully as I can, that I think, um, uh, she's, her, her, her remarks are absolutely right, are deep and well informed. Obviously, uh, I would, if you look at, I, I think about Graham Wood writing about uh, the, the, the kinds of people who fu fundamentalists who are attracted to, to ISIS, uh, and I think one of the, the theories that they have, one of the things that, that attracts them is a sense that the, the first caliphs were so successful in the world as they burst out of Arabia and conquered one great empire and conquered half of the other, and uh, what's the key to their success? Uh, and, a, and, and there are extremist uh, militants who, uh, who, who want to recapture that, but I think by, I believe if one looks at the history and asks what, would, what was it that enabled uh, the first, uh, the, the, the early caliphate to, 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 to be so politically successful, militarily and politically successful, you'd have to say it was tolerance. Tolerance is the number one virtue, and a tolerance of two sorts. A tolerance within, a, 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 an acceptance of, of different groups within that made it very hard for the Byzantines to, uh, to, to, to break up the, uh, the, 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 new, the new system, new political system into, into warring factions until 
the third, the fourth caliph, uh, and, uh, and, and tolerance of other people, of, of, of that the conquered populations knew that their traditions would be respected by, by, by this, the, the, the followers of this new faith. And, uh, and, and, the, and, and the election, and the selections of the early caliphs are things we don't understand as well, but it looks as certainly more like a democratic with broad input, Bob, Bob, input from, from than, 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 than certainly any institution in, in the thousand years, 500 years plus or minus of that, that, that date. Uh, so uh, in any civilization in the world that we know of. So uh, obviously democracy is fundamental to, is, is at least as fundamental in Islam as, as to any great, great uh, tradition in, in, in the civilizations of the world. Um, I understand now why identity is going to be hard for me because uh, actually, actually, let me back up and say one other thing, and that is, in preparation for this panel, I reread um, my paper with Adnan and, and Ali Chima on, on, from, uh, uh, that we wrote in 2012, tw revised in 2014. And what was most striking to me in rereading it is I was very worried about, about democracy in Pakistan then for a variety of reasons that are much less true today. Uh, and, and for the last couple of years, I've just been worried about democracy in America. So, um, so let's, you know, it's certainly we Americans have learned that uh, democracy can involve po bring politicians trying to bring out the worst in people, you know, animo in campaigning based on, on cleavages and uh, uh, on, on, on distrust, distrusting minority groups in the population is unfortunately sometimes a good tactic. And, uh, and that voters are sometimes attracted to authoritarianism by the appeal of somebody who will break the rules but will make something good happen, we, maybe. Um, I think as my, game, my professional game theoretic insight, and this, I'd just like to add a few words to, to what, what was said this morning, is that democracy requires, it's, democracy can degenerate into mere plebiscites to approve a, an authoritarian ruler who doesn't accept any legal restrictions but, but, but claims to represent the people because so many millions were induced to vote for him. Uh, for democracy to work, it has to be about competitive elections, and for competitive elections, they require good candidates with proven records of responsible public service. And in a new democracy, obviously, nobody's got a proven, you know, how many people have proven records of responsible public service other than the dictator you just threw out. Um, where does it come from? And ultimately, the, when I look at American history and its successes, I think the most important thing is federalism uh, because it creates a lot of local offices with real responsibility um, and, uh, that, and, and it's many people like federalism for a variety of reasons, but what I want to emphasize today is that federalism creates people who have not just slogans of, about that, that we've had too much corruption and we need to serve, we need government that will serve the people, but, but it, it creates a list of candidates who have actually gotten to do some of that and who still have, who would like to rise to higher office. When, uh, uh, on the failures of the Arab Spring, there was nobody talking this morning about local government. And to me, the, what really put the Egyptian electorate, the, the whole Egyptian political system in the wrong place was that the, that they, they fall, the, the, the demands for democracy led really first to, to, the, to the election of a president, and that's the wrong place to start. There, and there was nobody demanding that the actual, that the, the promises in, in the Constitution since Sadat's day of having locally elected count, municipal and provincial councils uh, with, it, with real responsibility, none of, nobody was demanding that. And the international so voices, let me, let me, so let me just say, yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say that this is this was supposed to be a punchline of okay. the local no. government. No, so no, but the, but the let well, point is back. no, let no, me no. Come the, back the, to this question. the supply of, of of proven candidates is not about identity, unfortunately. It's about the candidates, right. and that's uh, in it. In in, in, in answer, so Pakistan had without Pakistan has had democratic local government but only under military rulers. Whenever Ayub Khan, Zia ul Haq, and Musharraf each introduced local democracy, when, their, when, 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 when people became dissatisfied with their military control of the national government and they were replaced, the, Pakistan is divided into four, four provinces, one of which has half the population, 
but when the n national government and the provincial governments were, were, the civil were, were returned to civilian di rule, one of the first things that in each case the civilian popul leaders did was to suppress the local government. I assume that a desire not for, of, of backbenchers in the provincial assemblies not to have to compete with the mayors, uh, but to be the only, you know, to, but the result is that, that that was a motivating feature for, for suppressing it. And instead of having 80,000 elected officers as there were under, uh, under Musharraf, there were only, were only 1,100 uh, two years after his, uh, the return to democratic rule at the national level. Um, let me just say that the one thing I, in terms of identity where I think a real progress has been made and we haven't talked about it yet is in the tribal areas, the, the Fatah, the federally administered tribal areas. Uh, there has been real pro that there, there's now a schedule to, they're going to be integrated into Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. These are people who were, who were ethnically similar to their neighbors elsewhere in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. They uh, were kept under feudal rule, denied legal, full legal and political rights. And as far as I can see, so I'm a foreigner, but, but tell me if you can think of any reason why this, is, this has been true other than to, to provide a lawless playground for guerrilla groups. To, to destabilize Afghanistan, and uh, and perhaps it's because the Taliban are doing so well that the government is now willing to to, to, to tolerate. But but it's a real change. It's good for the people of the tribal areas. It's going to be good for the whole region, uh, and and that's a real pro progress. And there are laws uh, being debated now on on local government uh, in the provinces. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Roger. I mean, there are many, many themes that you brought up, and I think we'll come back to this local government versus uh, national government uh, in the due course. Uh, let me turn now to um, to Ali. Oh, and also, one more thing I wanted to say: you you sort of gave a pessimistic picture of democracy because at this point you're feeling that way in the U.S. But uh, I, you know, I, I hope Professor Bose and me, we share this optimism about, Ameri about India right now, which has gone to polls and 1.3 billion people are casting ballots right now. And we like to believe that, you know, something good comes out of this peaceful transfer of government. You may or may not like the government that's chosen, uh, you know, but, uh, but the process itself, uh, you know, it's hard to not feel optimistic about the process. Um, so let me turn to Ali, uh, who's had a ringside view of uh, capital markets. And as, as you all uh, know, one of the aspects of democracy is also a healthy, vibrant market for people. It, it would lead to jobs. It would lead to opportunities. And this is another lens at which to look at how uh, a democracy is functioning. So Ali, you've been um, at this apex uh, regulatory body in, um, in Pakistan. And what is the access uh, for a common man to some of these markets and to debt and to, you know, to get a loan to start a business? And uh, what, what would you like in an ideal world? OK, thank you, Sonu. And thank you to class at 73 for having me here. Uh, I think in order to understand the access to finance, which is uh, an outcome of uh, historical and social uh, uh, context. It's, it, it'll, it'll help if you can understand three or four themes which have played a role in where access to finance sta stands in Pakistani context today. Uh, it'll al also help us set the stage for, uh, uh, for discussion on identity politics, the way it is affecting Pakistan. Uh, firstly, I think it's important to understand the way Pakistan is structured. Uh, out of the four provinces, and as Roger said, one of the provinces, Punjab, has half the country's population, 100 million people. All the four provinces are structured on homogeneous ethno-linguistic basis. So the four provinces have one ethnicity each, speaking a certain domestic language, and only one province, Sindh, has migrants who came from India who speak a different language and who belong to a different ethnicity. So the country is structured on very ethno-linguistic basis since partition, and that hasn't changed. Uh, that's, I think, one theme which has played an important role in where uh, identity politics uh, uh, stands today. Uh, the second theme is the economic injustice, which has prevailed in the minds of the people since early, since 1960s. Um, although in 1960s, during Ayub Khan's regime, who was a military ruler, 
there was effort to uh, to to reduce the feeling of uh, uh, of identity politics because he created a one unit um, uh, system uh, however uh, there was feeling of economic injustice in the minds of people in east pakistan so in 1971 when east pakistan uh, was separated and bangladesh was created just to give an example the party which was uh, being represented by pe- people in east pakistan bangladesh they won i think all the seats in that assembly versus the party on the west pakistan won all the seats so that was the difference in um, uh, in in how the identities played a role in um, in politics at that time since 1971 so that economic injustice has left a mark in the minds of the people uh a uh, couple with uh, added to that if we look at uh, uh, the the way uh, uh, politics has been affected during the times of military rulers uh, th- that also has impacted uh, the economic outcome in the country today for example uh, since 19 till 1970s when zulfikar ali bhutto father of benazir bhutto was ruler uh, at that time the identity politics was not very strong he being from sen was elected at the national level all over the country he got votes and he was able to make a majority uh, government however after that in 80s when ziaul haq a military ruler was in power uh, at that time a party was created called mqm uh, karachi based party which was and is fighting for the rights of the migrants so that party was uh, among the initial stages of how identity politics started or strengthened in the country after that during the same time period the sharif party was created nawaz sharif party pmln was created and that represents a large part of people from punjab so these developments during the military rulers have also played its role so if you look at the ethno linguistic structuring of the country coupled with economic injustice how military rulers have uh, ruled the country and how new parties have emerged so what this has done is the institutions in the country have remained weak just to give you a number today there is an estimate that 30 to 50% of pakistan's economy is in the informal sector undocumented sector out of 200 million people roughly 100 million are not banked uh, only 23% have access to finance uh, uh, within the formal financial system so with these realities what is happening is most people are keeping their savings in the form of cash or they go to the local land owner for their financing needs or their for lending needs so that's one reality in the country secondly in terms of the formal banking system uh uh in the abs- in an environment where where state is not able to meet uh, a lot of needs for the people uh, where the credit rating system is a bit ineffective and where the judicial system is weak uh, what is happening is the banks which are owned by various business groups they end up giving lending money to people they personally know or they personally comfortable so it's name lending lending rather than business lending now what that does is it is leading to concentration of capital within certain communities and these are the dynamics which has which have played a role in limiting access to finance to people so uh, and and this i would like to expand on access to finance and call it at access to economic opportunities uh over the last uh, few years 10 years especially um when uh, civilians have been ruling uh, what has happened is because of the parliamentary democracy that we have cabinet consists of the party which has the majority in the parliament and they have in the last 10 years belonged to people from uh, two different provinces and when they come in power they've tried to get jobs for their own voters within various government institutions so what is happening is then at a country level on one hand access to finance is limited certain communities are getting stronger as far as um, uh, wealth concentration is concerned and political parties because they keep supporting their voter base in terms of jobs and economic opportunities so th- the identity politics is getting strengthened day by day i think overall economics has played a big role uh, in the way uh identity politics has strengthened in pakistan over the years thank, thank you. you ali um so so let me turn to ruhi uh, and again coming back to the question of um, access 
and this time again to water just as iram had talked about rural areas and farmers and you know and uh, and what's happening um, to to agriculture and those who depend on the indus valley ruhi has done extensive work on studying water service delivery in karachi so looking at urban areas and so who are these i would call them water haves and water have nots so what determines who gets water and who doesn't and and is that creating a group of uh, you know have nots who who need to organize themselves or, and are not able to organize themselves so what is uh, what is your take ruhi hello yeah. thank you sono uh, and thank you pan the panel the uh, class act uh, so let me start with the story so there there's a very famous story by wallace it goes as such there are two young fish swimming along and and they happen to meet an older fish um swimming the other way who nods at them and says morning boys how is the water the two young fish swim on for a bit and then one looks over to the other and says what the hell is water <laughs> the point of the fish story is merely uh that the most obvious and important realities uh are the hardest to see and talked about as water is transparent and is not visible uh to us or as it's not visible to the young fish so coming back to the context of pakistan water and identity so i don't know how many people in this room know that uh water is was declared a human right in 2010 uh the i uh, said Uh, the it was declared as uh, the the um, the universal declaration was uh, of human rights of human rights was instituted in 1948 but it was only in 2010 that water was declared a human right uh, 62 years later um, according to which everyone is entitled to sufficient safe acceptable physically accessible and affordable water for personal and domestic use it means if we accept pakistan is a democ democracy then uh democratically everyone should have access to it pakistan gained independence in 1947 17 years 70 years later today i cannot say with confidence that everybody has a household water connection they may have access in different form or manner but they do not have a household connection coming to karachi from where i am uh, a city which is has a population of 25 million people it's a it's qualified as a mega city access to water access to water is 80 to 90% but actual connection to water may be lagging at 60% access to sanitation is around 60% there's a thriving informal market for water which delivers inf informally delivers water to your house uh the water supply is almost 50% less than the demand meaning the water available to karachi is 50% less than what is required on a daily basis there's a very high non revenue meaning that either water is stolen it's leaked so we lose the water in terms of 60% of our water is lost that way um the utility that's a public agency with no ring fence uh and has a managing director that's appointed by the government um runs at a loss it's subsidized by the uh, by the um uh, the government of sind and water comes on interim basis meaning that you will get water 2 to 3 hours uh every day um facilities uh, sewerage is not treated uh all untreated sewerage is discharged into the arabian sea and so the things are really bad and maybe uh we are the fishes that are not seeing the situation <laughs> um in this context i i would i would raise uh, a couple of things that were raised by the panel one things that that karachi should be very 
conscious of moving forward. One is climate change. Climate change is going to have a severe impact on one growing population, uh, which is uh, which is totally out of control. Um, cities, the city of Karachi is growing. The sprawl is growing. Uh, availability of water, uh, which is a scarce resource, resource, it's depleted. It's depleting. Uh, there is no common property regulation in Karachi on groundwater extraction. So these people who are the informal uh, mafia that selling water is extracting a common property resource and selling it as a private good. Um, uh, regulation is very weak. Um, and the political buy-in maybe is available, but it's, uh, it's available when it's needed, when, uh, when governments are changing and it's an item on the agenda. But it's not an item on the agenda that remains there for a long time, so uh, changes can happen. One last thing I would like to add here on the, in the context of identity politics, and I don't, I, it's rather difficult to I, associate water with the identity aspect, but, but I would say that related to social media, I think, I, I think Karachi needs to have a movement like, uh, like Me Too, Me Without Water, or something like that, <laughs> hashtag. So. Um, that's, I mean, I, this is oh, oh, looking forward to your thoughts and thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ruhi. So I think in this brief, uh, quick presentation from the four panelists, I think we're getting a picture of, you know, how certain identities are formed. Uh, you know, because of the state of democracy, there's consolidation of power, whether it's in, uh, you know, rent seeking in the form of water, mafia in Karachi, or whether it's the uh, you know the money lenders who are lending only because someone belongs to a certain family so as ali called it name lending there is uh, you know uh, uh, landholders who uh, belong to a certain class or who who have captured the water resources in the indus valley and so now i think the question is that how do we break these norms, uh, you know, because these are not the kind of identities or the, you know, these are not the have nots that we would like in a democracy. So uh, I don't know if, uh, uh, Roger, you would like to again talk a little bit about the way government is structured in Pakistan. And, you know, it was very interesting. You were giving these numbers that under military rule, there is actually a local government. Or elections. And, and then in, in civil uh, rule, there is less. And also, uh, who really takes cares, uh, care of these have-nots and, and the disenfranchised and people who do not have rights? Is it the federal government or is it the local government? Uh, who is better placed? Or to, the provincial government. Or the provincial government. Yeah. I, but I, I think uh, the... the Musharraf systems of local governments were shut down. The, uh, the democracy was reestablished at the end of 2017, early 2018. And it was summer of 2019. I'm sorry. That's not 2019. I'm sorry. Two, a decade earlier. 2007, 2008, excuse me. Uh, and it was 2009 uh, that the, the local, that, that the edicts went out to dissolve in each province the local governments that had been elected under Musharraf in it's the summer of 2009. In January of 2010, there were, there were floods of the Indus River. And there were, we heard lots of stories about communities, small isolated villages that would suffer terribly uh, when they didn't get help and were, were cut off by the flood. Um, I can't help wondering. I don't know anything. I don't have any direct data. But when you replace it with district magistrates who were responsible for hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and got rid of councils that were elected on the basis of a, of a few thousand people uh, that suddenly have erased pol people in the political system uh, to advocate the interests of, 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 of localities. Uh, uh, it's, it is very convenient to, to members of the Provincial Assembly and members of the National Assembly to, to have only two elected officials per for, for several hundred thousand, for half a million, you know, districts that are size of 300,000 at the provincial level, half a million at the national level. Uh, so, you know, access to your office is a scarce and valuable commodity, access to, 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 to help. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is the people in the country would be better served. I think this is one of, when I think of how democracy can do harm, 
when we're in America, we tend to believe the transition for democracy is just a good thing. And as a rough cut, I guess I, I, could, I think that's not a stupid thing to say, but, to, but a transition to democracy can do harm, and Pakistan is a good example of that to the extent that the national, when generals ran the country, they knew that they needed some legitimation, they needed some mechanism for tolerating a certain kind of popular input into their policy, political system, but they wanted a nice low level. Once you had it at the national level, you had all these, these, these backbenchers in the provincial assembly who didn't want, actually want the competition from, the, uh, from, from mayors uh, at the local level. They wanted to be the only person to go to in their district, and, and that's, uh, that's where it does harm, and it does, and it does mean that there are going to be groups that are left out. I'll say one other thing, that is that on electoral systems, it occurred, the, the, the statistic about Uttar Pradesh in India having 20% Muslims but, but zero, uh, we all understand if they're distributed across the district and, the, and India, like America and like Pakistan, generally use single member, first past the post single member district, it takes only, it only takes a majority and a 20% minority can be systematically, uh, a 49% minority can be systematically uh, ignored by the by the political class, and to some extent that becomes an argument for something like a proportional representation system. Uh, even, it could be even a small district, but if you had four seats that are allocated proportionally, four or five seats in a the district, then you guarantee that 20% uh, minorities can, can, can get one at least one seat at the table uh, and be part of the political system. Um, and so the, to some extent as a game theorist, it does make a difference. Uh, but but the first thing is 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 getting low, some some responsibility down to a lower level. Sure, you know, just, I just wanted to jump in very quickly and just take up the issue of floods, which I think is very very important because that really does sort of structure people's lives, and you know you can sort of lose everything. I don't know how many of you know this or how many have you been keeping up with this, but essentially here in the U.S. right now, uh, you know, in the springs there have been massive flooding in the Midwest. And a lot of America's big water infrastructure essentially is managed by the Army Corps of Engineers, which is this federal you know, agency, very, very large. And the state level governments have pretty much nothing to do, um, certainly at the municipalities level. I mean, you know, if it's hitting your town, all you can really do is put sandbags up. I mean, there's nobody who's controlling your water infrastructure but the Army Corps of Engineers. And there's a certain way that the Corps will protect the hard built infrastructure which is exactly what WABDA, which is a Water and Power Development Authority in Pakistan, will do in Pakistan. If a flood is hitting, it happens in China, it happens in the US, this is like standard practice, no one is going to risk the infrastructure. So essentially, once you manage something like water, which can be very destructive as well as life-giving across very big scales, uh, you have to sort of accrete power up. That's sort of what's happening. Power is moving up. Here it's moving to the Army Corps. Um, you know, there it's moving to Wabda, et cetera. So I think that there's nothing specifically strange about saying that local communities are disenfranchised when you do infrastructure at that scale. That's, it's a fact, we haven't figured it out, we just have not figured it out globally, it's not a problem that we've cracked. So I, I just wanna put, put, you know, sort of these are, these are global struggles, these are global problems with how do you manage infrastructure, um, so it, it remains a challenge. The only thing that I think I'd like to add on this, and I want us to start thinking about this a little bit, because so much of this is like sort of inclusion, exclusion, and identity in how we see ourselves as sort of like human beings. But a lot of what we do when sort of say water doesn't get to the delta is what we have done as human beings with the way that we manage infrastructure is that we have really probably killed the ecosystem of countless species that we haven't I mean, that we didn't even know existed, right? So there's, there's a massive sort of ecological exclusion here, and I want to help, I mean, I want us to think about how is it that we build those concerns into the kind of sort of, you know, management and sort of policy and legal regimes that we build, because really no one here is talking about the species. It's all like, let's do stuff for human populations, which, you know, which is great, but there is massive harm that we are doing to species that we don't even know exist. So I just, I just wanted to put that in terms of what's excluded. I think countless species who cannot speak for themselves and, and, and ecosystems and, you know, everything is excluded in, in what we build. 
thanks, uh, thanks, Irab, for bringing that point. I mean, that's something very close to what I work on, natural resources and access to natural resources. And, you know, this is a question that I, I ask sometimes in frustration, that when is it that, uh, you know, an election manifesto in, in my part of the world, in South Asia, will have words like climate change? Or, uh, you know, access to water, maybe some of them do, but, but never climate change and never ecosystem restoration or forests, uh, you know, and, and it started, I think, at a time when, um, you know, most politicians believed that growth and environmental concerns were like sort of anti and, you know, it was either or. So even as recent as 15, 20 years ago, even newspaper editors, you know, some of the newspapers I worked in, you know, there was this belief that let's not let's not oppose big infrastructure projects, as Iram was saying. You know, that that was a symbol of growth. You know, and and I I feel that that was really short sighted. So I think one of the questions that I would like panelists to also reflect on that what will it take for these issues to become election issues based on which candidates are chosen or rejected or you know our parties are are uh, made to be accountable. So I don't know if Ruhi or Ali, if you have some thoughts on this. Okay, so I, I want to start by uh, adding a data point to Roger's. Uh, uh, so decentralization, which happened uh, during the Musharraf's regime, uh, they decentralized institutionally, but they did not decentralize fiscally. And that was the problem. So I've been working in Punjab for the last uh, two, three years. And uh, Punjab, uh, in Lahore, uh, the decentralized organization is also manda mandated to provide water. And the VASAs, which is a provisional organization, is also mandated. And the, the law has to go through provisional assembly to be discarded and hasn't been. So both the things are working in parallel but only one person, one organization is doing the job. So this is the dysfunctionality institutionally in Pakistan. Money and water? No, oh. so uh, the decentralization happened of institutions by under Musharraf's regime. That law was never thrown out. It's still there. It's still kicking and alive. So there is an organization that actually, th th there are these uh, organizations that are targeting only rural areas now, not the urban areas. But because the, the mandate of the urban areas is, is with Vasas now, I with see. the provisional organ. So, that, that, so the thing is I that it's- for the law of 2013. The, yeah, uh, yeah. So, there, so for us to go in as a World Bank to do anything, we first have to discharge that law, the decentralization. Anyways, okay, so uh, coming back to the question that um, that Sonu asked uh, about what, so uh, essentially uh, f the last election just that just happened maybe a year, less than a year ago, yeah. Uh, so uh, the World Bank is preparing a project in Pakistan and uh, this uh, water was on the agenda. Uh, and uh, and the and PTI and PPP, they were all, the, the, they wanted to do something on the water sector. And they pushed, and because there's, as I indicated, there was a shortage in supply and demand, so they said, okay, let's explore other options of desalinization. But uh, desalination is an expensive option, and going in, you can't just say, oh, we're going to do desalination, right? Uh, without exploring options of available water that's available. So based on what Iram had said, so the water, Karachi is downstream, the water is coming to Karachi, the water that reaches Karachi, uh, Sindh, out of that 60% water is diverted to agriculture. And only 40% comes to the, uh, for drinking. So, so there is definitely an issue here. And, um, and it can, I mean, I think it can be on the political agenda even now with the new government and uh, for pushing it. But, but definitely it's, it should be a priority because with the population numbers growing, with climate change threat, um, with um, with the sprawl of Karachi, yeah. Can you just uh, yeah. uh, quickly touch upon and uh, the question you raised and uh, Roger's comment? Uh, 
I, I would like to take us to identity politics at a at, at an at, at a broader level, at a macro level, because I think we have talked about some of the issues, uh, how identity politics is so strong because of ethnicity or language. Religion also plays a role that we haven't touched upon, but. Uh, that has also played a role and it's an increasing identity in Pakistan because of various sects within Islam. Uh, but you, you asked about how can we, uh, uh, more of a prescriptive question it was, I believe. Uh, and not just Pakistan, if we look at a lot of developing countries, uh, political parties and politicians have played identities um, uh, uh, as far as winning elections is concerned. They have, they have harnessed that energy in a negative sense. Um, and here I would like to raise a point, and it will it'll be great to get Roger's views on that. Uh, <clears throat> the way the political system is structured in Pakistan and a lot of developing countries, we have inherited the system from uh, 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 colonial times when Britain left us. And we have parliamentary democracy in which uh, elections are won by uh, politicians uh, on the basis of first pa past the post. Uh, so anybody in Pakistan in the last election a lot of uh, uh, politicians won seats and they are sitting in parliament today by winning somewhere from 17 to 20 percent of the votes and we call it democracy. So the parliamentary democracy system, the way we are following it, if this is continued, this is a system in, and, and we have to look at it in the context of the way uh, politics and elections are funded in developing countries. Uh, there is no formal uh, declared mechanism that a very small amount is approved by the election commission in which fund, uh, campaigns are not financed. So you're talking about in the Pakistani context roughly half a million dollars as the election campaign money which needs to be invested by the candidates. And that money is not really coming from a formal sector, it's not documented, the size of informal economy is very large. So people spend their own money to, to win elections or to run elections. When they, so people who are running elections in the National Assembly, they're spending half a million dollars from their pocket. Provincial Assembly, you're talking about 150 to $200,000 budget. So the reason they are coming, a lot of them, not all, is they want to make four times the money. So out of the 1,100 parliamentarians who are the public representatives and who are the policy makers and who are running our country, if they are competing in elections with the thought process that I'm going to invest X and I'm going to make four X, so corruption is at a very higher level in the country. And with these leaders, how can we get rid of corruption at, at the grassroots level, fund, firstly? Secondly, this also plays in the insecurities of the minds of the people, like the point that Roger touched upon in the military, uh, when the military rulers are ruling, because they need to legitimize themselves. So they do not really form these parliaments, parliaments in the beginning. They, need, they, they set up uh, government at the local grassroots level, which is good for the country. However, it's not sustainable. When the elections are held, the parliamentarians, because they've spent so much money, so they do not want that system. So in a parliamentary democracy system, the way we are following it, which runs in the minds of these, in the hands of these politicians, and they want to encourage identity politics, they want to control the masses through jobs, through finance, through, uh, uh, through the livelihood. So how can we make this an end? And this is one of the important reasons why Despite 70 years of independence, Pakistan still has only four provinces. I mean, it's not, it, it doesn't need a genius to figure out that why do we have one province which has 100 million people. Karachi is a city of 20 million people. If we were just to break down the units, automatically uh, the identity politics will be weakened, number one. Uh, the governance will get better, local grassroots politicians or councillors or mayors will come, so a lot of problems can be answered, but it's not happening. And the point I want to raise, and there's a question to Roger, uh, will you work on that? What do you believe is the role of the political system, the system of democracy that we have in Pakistan in a lot of developing countries? So we have only uh, a few minutes left before we open the floor. So if you can answer in 30 seconds, if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's asking. I'll, I'll say professionally is that, that I, I was, so my best, best theoretical work was on, on theories of, of why corruption cannot be banished, but the design of the institutions can change the, the form of the corruption greatly and uh, in ways that can make a difference. Uh, I'll, if I've got 36 seconds, that's, that's a start. Yes. Uh, no, I'm sure we can, we can get into it. I, I think um, this is, 
uh, when I, in, interacting with the idea that that, that, that multi-layer democracy, the devolution of power is, is, is better to reduce the systemic corruption. I, I want to defend that proposition along with the observation that almost everywhere local government is much more corrupt than national government. Uh, but the, corru the, the corruption of, of an elected, it, when the, the corruption of, 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 of a, of a me member of parliament when only party me identity matters, so voters vote for the, the member of parliament in a single member district just because of who he, you know, because, because of, they care about who he's going to vote for, for, for chief minister or prime minister, because, and that's party identity only, then indeed his corruption is going to be exactly, is going to be sell, use the power of the office for, for profit, uh, sell legislative favors for money. Uh, a municipal mayor who might run on a similar sized district, actually, people actually care about what the mayor does to provide service and the corruption we get in our municipalities is typically much broader based, that is to say, a lot of favors for a broad patronage network. That's what we got, to, we, have, we know that very well in, in Chicago, for example, where I live. Um, uh, but that's, in some ways, that's a better form of corruption. It's, it's, it's still corruption. Uh, there are lots of people who are, not, who are paying taxes or paying higher prices and getting nothing for it, but, but the, the benefits are being spread much more broadly. Uh, but, uh, but the other side of the argument is the mayor or the, who, who does a better job then becomes a candidate for higher, higher office, and national government tends to be less corrupt when there is responsible local government. In that sense, I've tried to argue multi-levels of democracy, as we've always had in the United States, tends to reduce the corruption in the system. We, don't, we have pl plenty of corruption in our states and municipalities in the United States, but we have a much less corrupt national government than when we would have if the national government ran everything and our mayors and governors were appointed by the, the, under the Secretary of Interior, uh, appointed by the President. Thank you. Okay, Iram. Like I really 30 seconds. Also, literally 30 seconds, just to answer your question. I think a really good model of what's happening in South Asia is the Aam Aadmi Party in Delhi. I think it's really fascinating. They really have made uh, sort of ecosystem, you know, sort of restoration and water services a real election issue. It's, they're putting serious sort of, you know, money and capital behind it. But what they're really doing as a result is that they have committed that if they're elected next time also, they're going to go ahead and restore 600 underground aquifers and lakes around Delhi. I all most want a lot of political parties and city governments across South Asia, including in Pakistan and Bangladesh, to really look at what the Aam Aadmi Party is doing, but it is an election issue. They are getting elected as a result of it. And maybe that is going to feed better governance and, and sort of, you know, a lot of a lot of the desirables that we're hoping for, I think they've made them a political viable issue. Thanks, Iram. Uh, so for those who don't know Aam Aadmi Party, so that's the party in power in Delhi. So that's the state uh, party, whereas the federal federal government is another party, BJP and Modi. Uh, so another fallout of this is that Delhi and the central government don't see eye to eye on pollution issues. And as you know, Delhi is facing tremendous amount of air pollution. But because these two parties are different from each other and are fighting all the time, uh, Delhi's pollution issue is unsolved. I mean, that's a very simplistic view of the whole situation. So on that note, thank you, uh, Roger, Iram, Ali, and Ruhi, and a round of applause for the panelists.